Baseball. America's pastime is a game with storied history. However, over the last decade or so, there's a fairly consistent phrase I've heard from friends, fans, and even sports radio personalities. The phrase I'm talking about? I just don't watch baseball like I used to. That then usually gets followed up with, I don't know, somewhere in the late 2000s I just kind of fell off. I don't know as many players as I used to, and I just don't care to watch as many games as I used to. Even more so, I've seen pretty consistent comments on many baseball YouTubers' videos that go somewhere along the lines of, you got me back into baseball. So naturally, over time, that got me thinking, what happened? Why did so many people, even the hardcore baseball fan, decide collectively right around the same time frame that baseball is essentially not worth the time they used to put into it? To be completely transparent, I too fell into that category. Growing up in the late 90s and 2000s, I could name essentially every player on every team. I was excited to watch teams I didn't even root for, and I wasn't alone in that sentiment. I then also fell off somewhere in the late 2000s and early 2010s. I would still watch every now and then, and generally keep up, but it just wasn't the same. In this video, I'll go over what common themes I was able to uncover as to what made baseball so special in this time period. Additionally, I'd also love to hear if you feel the same and what your fandom experience was like during this time frame versus today. So sound off in the comments. Let's get started. The mid-90s were an interesting time for Major League Baseball, so we'll start with the year 1994, the strike-shortened year. Baseball was in trouble. Fans were furious with the way the strike played out, and many threatened to never watch baseball again as they believed clearly the owners and players only cared about money and not the fans. Amongst a myriad of what-ifs, the Expos were having their best season and had the best record in baseball at the time. They hadn't made the playoffs since 1981. Coincidentally, some fans are very quick to forget that the Yankees, before winning the 1996 World Series, were not having a good time in the 90s. They also had not made the playoffs since 1981. One. The Yankees had the best record in the American League at the time, and this would have been Don Mattingly's postseason debut and best chance to win a World Series. The list of what-ifs goes on and on, but ultimately the point is the fans suffered, every team suffered, and the players suffered. There were organized fan protests post-strike, and Major League Baseball was never in a lower place. They even had to use replacement players that had no MLB experience and replacement umpires. That's how bad it got. So we'll skip over to 1996 when some real magic started happening. We'll start with the power surge. In 1996, a new record for home runs was hit in the regular season. The old record was 4,458 in 1987, and the new record was now 4,962. It was completely eclipsed. It was the first season in the divisional era to have teams play 162 games as well. The Yankees won the World Series for the first time since 1978 with Joe Torre in as the manager for his first year with them, and it was with a mix of veterans and new faces like Derek Jeter, Jorge Posada, Mariano Rivera, Vera and Andy Pettit. This was also the first year with new television rights with ESPN, Fox, and NBC. This gave us the Fox Saturday afternoon game of the week with their Fox Saturday baseball broadcast. The announcers were Joe Buck, Tim McCarver, Tom Brenneman, and Bob Brenly. We also continued to get the classic ESPN Sunday and Wednesday night baseball with John Miller and Joe Morgan. The 1997 season featured the year's eventual World Series champion Florida Marlins, who were in just their fifth season as being a new expansion team. Ken Griffey Jr. went off and won his only MVP in his Hall of Fame career this year. The 1998 season brought us two new teams, bringing us to 30 with the Diamondbacks and the Devil Rays. New fan bases were being born, which is always good for the sport. Speaking of the home run surge, yes, we know it was the steroid era, but at the time, hey, ignorance was bliss. The 1998 home run chase between Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa was something, even as a kid, that was must-see TV. We got to witness something every day that we hadn't seen since Roger Maris did in 1961 with his 61 home runs. Just the year prior, McGuire and Ken Griffey Jr. hit 58 and 56 home runs respectively. The entire 1998 season was a back and forth battle between Sosa and McGuire. On September 8th, we got to see both Sluggers teams face off on a nationally televised game. McGuire had tied Maris's record the night before. 
And with what it felt like was scripted destiny against Sosa with 58 home runs, a man who he battled all year to the home run record, McGuire hits number 62 off Steve Traxel. But it wasn't over after that game. It only meant that Mark got there first. Throughout the rest of the year, there were times where Sosa had more home runs than McGuire. It came down to the last few games of the season as to who would hold the new home run record. It ended up being Mark McGuire with 70 home runs and Sammy Sosa with 66. Insane to think that a record that stood since 1961 was beaten by two people in the same year. Also, a new home run record was set at 5,064 for the season. Yeah, I know, steroid era, we're moving on. On the other hand, the Yankees won the World Series for the second time in three years. The evil empire was back and they were hungry for even more rings. If there's anything we know about sports fandom, it's that there is nothing like bonding with even rival teams fans to root against a larger enemy, and that larger enemy was the Yankees. Whether you love or hate them, they became must-watch baseball. Yankee fans tuned in to root for them to win, and everyone else tuned in to root for them to lose. Either way, it was something incredibly fun to watch. Baseball was back. In 1999, there was even more home runs hit this season. The 1998 record was 5,064, and the new record was now 5,528. The Yankees won the World Series yet again, and the new dynasty was born. Everybody except Yankee fans really hated that. But this ended up being really good for baseball. In fact, in 2004, the New York Times wrote an article about this phenomenon. Even when the Yankees went on the road, fans showed up to watch them, whether it was a weekday game or a night game, which are typically the least attended type of games, if the Yankees were in town, that game was going to sell out. Dan Magala, a sports marketing analyst, attributed this phenomenon to there being so many transplanted New Yorkers who want to see them and so many people who hate them. They have that villainish image, he said. I think most people would agree with that. They had the stars people wanted to see and they were the best team in baseball over the past 100 years. Even I, as a young Mets fan, couldn't help but watch on. The Subway Series magnified this even further now that interleague play was a thing for the past couple of seasons. We got to see teams play against each other that would normally be reserved for World Series matchups. We even got to see an ejected Bobby Valentine sport a mustache made of eye black and he wore sunglasses to disguise himself from umpires. Everyone got a good laugh at it according to him, even the umpires did, but he was still fined $5,000 and received a two game suspension for the stunt. But when a great team like the Yankees is around, it's much more fun to watch another great team take them on. There are very few things that are as good as a good sports rivalry, but man, the late 90s to about 2004-ish was absolutely legendary as far as Yankees and Red Sox was concerned. Those games turned into events to watch. They were unmissable. The Red Sox were consistently coming in second place in the AL East since 98 and were trying to break the curse of the Bambino, all while the Yankees just got better and better and seemed unstoppable. But even so, both teams had superstars and you could just see the tension between the fans and the players during these series. We got to see incredible pitching matchups between Pedro Martinez and ex-Red Sox, now Yankee Roger Clemens. It was also during this time frame that both teams met for the first time ever in the ALCS, which fueled the rivalry further. Throughout the years, we got to see both teams battle. Some games would be absolutely lopsided, but most felt like they came down to the wire with walk-off wins or final inning comebacks. Some of the craziest bench-clearing brawls we've ever seen happen during this time. The 2003 ALCS was wild to say the least. We saw Pedro Martinez throw a 72-year-old Don Zimmer to the ground after Zimmer was charging at him while the bench is cleared. On top of that, Yankees Kareem Garcia and Jeff Nelson fought with a Fenway Park groundskeeper in the bullpen to which they were issued a summons for assault and battery. MLB Commissioner Bud Selig then fined Pedro Martinez $50,000, Manny Ramirez $25,000, Garcia $10,000, and Zimmer $5,000. In that same ALCS, it all came down to a Game 7 where Aaron Boone, of all people, hits a walk off home run off Tim Wakefield to send the Yankees to the World Series. And thus, the legend of Aaron Bleeping Boone was born. And going into this series, the Red Sox were the favorites, so it hurt even more when the Yankees still found a way to beat them. The rivalry intensified even more the next year. Alex Rodriguez was rumored to be going to the Red Sox for months, but eventually landed with the Yankees. This was because the Yankees' then third baseman hero of the 2003 ALCS Aaron Boone had a freak basketball accident and was to miss significant time that year. 
The 2004 season even featured a game where the Yankees had a 13-inning comeback where Derek Jeter famously flew into the third base stands at full speed catching a Trot Nixon pop-up to which it caused him to get cut up pretty badly in his face. And then, just a few weeks after that, both teams met yet again and had a benches-clearing brawl when Jason Veritek shoved his glove into A-Rod's face after he was hit by a Bronson Arroyo pitch. That brings us to a rematch in the ALCS between the two teams. The 2004 ALCS had so many moments that some times you forget they all happened within the span of one series. It featured moments that you could never forget, like A-Rod slapping the ball out of Arroyo's hand while he was running to first base. We got the famous Kurt Schilling bloody sock start where he reportedly tore a tendon sheath in his right ankle the series prior. His tendon was then sutured prior to the game start and he was given local anesthetic and painkillers. Apparently, the suture tore during his start which caused the bloody sock, but he still went out and pitched seven innings allowing just one run. This this series was also filled by extra inning comebacks. The Yankees went up three games to none, but ultimately it was the Red Sox who came back in unprecedented fashion to win the series 4-3. Coming back from three games to none had never been done before. It was considered the greatest postseason collapse in history. The Red Sox defeated their greatest rival, the juggernaut dynasty Yankees. They went on to beat the Cardinals in a clean sweep to then break the curse of the Bambino for their first World Series win since 1918. It was just unreal watching this happen live. However, there was more to that. The entire production value added so much to everything as well. To pivot a little bit, let's talk about media. There was just something so special about those ESPN Sunday Night Baseball games. On our 16th season as our national pastimes game of the week. This is ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. Hello everyone, I'm John Bono along with Joe Morgan and welcome to Sunday Night Baseball. When that theme was on and you just knew it was Yankee, Red Sox, or any top team really, and John Miller and Joe Morgan as commentators for the next three hours or so, it was going to be some of the best baseball you'll watch. Speaking of music themes, when it was postseason time or even just that Saturday afternoon game of the day, the Fox baseball theme created this strange Pavlovian response where you knew something epic was going to happen. The World Series back then just felt different, and say what you will about Joe Buck, Tim McCarver, Tom Brenneman, and Bob Brenly, they were the voices of the postseason and World Series to a generation. And welcome back to the 2000 World Series on Fox. As the National League's best, the New York Mets visit the American League's best, the New York Yankees in a place simply known as the stadium. It's game one on Fox. So yeah, the ESPN and Fox Baseball themes with their respective broadcasting crews were just incredible and added to the mystique of baseball around this time. The postseason just felt even more intense as so many people just wanted to watch the Yankees lose. We got to see classic matchups like the 2000 Subway Series. There was enough intensity with the Crosstown Rivals meeting in the World Series alone. But the added drama of Roger Clemens hitting Mike Piazza with a fastball in the head earlier that year, causing Piazza to miss the All-Star game, you just knew that wasn't going to be the end of it. In Game 2 of the Subway World Series, Piazza fouled a ball off that broke his bat. While jogging up the first baseline, Clemens picked up the barrel of the bat that had just broken off with a very sharp edge on it and threw it in Piazza's direction. This caused the benches to clear, with Clemens stating he thought it was the ball, which let's be real makes no sense because why would you throw the ball at the batter and not towards first base if you thought that? The Yankees ended up winning the 2000 World Series for their fourth in five years, but Piazza then got a bit of revenge as he caught for Clemens in the 2004 All-Star Game while they were representing the Mets and Astros respectively. Clemens got lit up for six runs in the first inning, which I'm sure felt good to see on Piazza's end. Dominance was the theme from 1996 to 2004, and one of those figures was Barry Bonds. He really hit his stride offensively and defensively during this time span. A polarizing figure today, but back then, he was just another reason why baseball was simply a must-watch event. If the Maguire-Sosa home run chase taught us anything, it's that people love the home run, and Bonds was chasing it in two ways. In 2001, he beat Mark Maguire's single-season home run record by three, hitting 73 for the season, and by 2007, he was the all-time home run leader of 762. He was undoubtedly the most feared hitter in baseball. Teams would just straight up refuse to pitch to him and give him free walks. He would lead the league in on-base percentage countless times with an OBP as high as 609 in 2004. Not surprisingly, he is the all-time leader in intentional walks with 688. The absolute dominance we saw from him from gold gloves to MVPs to silver sluggers was just simply insane. 
The 2001 season continued to bring iconic moments that will forever be remembered. For the first time in history, a Japanese position player was playing in the major leagues. He was simply known as Ichiro. He didn't have the typical build of a major leaguer, but he was one of the best in baseball. He ended up winning the AL MVP, Rookie of the Year, a Gold Glove, a Silver Slugger, a batting title, and was the most voted starting position player in the All-Star Game that year. Speaking of the 01 All-Star Game, this was also the one where we said goodbye to Cal Ripken Jr. It it was during this game where Alex Rodriguez switched from shortstop to third base to let Cal play one last time in shortstop during an all-star game. It's a clip that we still see pop up from time to time till this day. Baseball during this time brought the nation together. After the September 11th terrorist attacks, the world completely changed. Everything stopped. There was this feeling of, will things ever go back to normal? When do we start our new normal? Essentially, all major sporting events were postponed or straight up canceled. Everything was just quiet and for completely understandable reasons. Just 10 days after the 9-11 attacks, at the urging of President George W. Bush to convince MLB to resume their schedule, baseball helped bring America back together. The New York Mets played the first sports game in New York since the tragedy. They faced their divisional rival, the Atlanta Braves. Even with the fear of gathering so many people so soon, it wasn't enough to stop this game or Shea Stadium from selling out. This included 10,000 walk-up tickets being purchased. Mark DeRosa, a New Jersey native with the Braves at the time, recalls seeing bomb-sniffing dogs and police snipers on towers. Tom Glavin with the Braves also remembers hearing chatter that something else could happen. But Glavin said part of the obstacle of truly being able to get back to normal was having events like that and going to stadiums with big crowds that were kind of vulnerable targets and having faith that everything was going to be all right. Every Mets player, every umpire and Braves player with ties to New York wore NYPD and FDNY hats. The pregame ceremony was something that was done so respectfully as well. There were tributes to the victims of the attacks. Fans were chanting, USA, USA. Mark Anthony performed the national anthem. Diana Ross sang God Bless America, and then both teams met in the middle of the field to give each other handshakes and hugs. Even Glavin said, let's face it, in those days, those were two teams that didn't like each other, so for the two teams to come together the way we did was a big deal. I think the biggest thing was seeing Braves manager Bobby Cox and Mets manager Bobby Valentine hug each other. There was no love loss between those guys. Pete Van Weeren and Don Sutton, the Braves broadcasters at the time, described the scene perfectly. Van Weeren said, what we hope can happen is that this little baseball game, which is really a very insignificant thing in the grand scheme of things, can help be a part of the healing process. Sutton followed up with one step back and in a show of solidarity that I think is now what we're seeing almost everywhere around our country in every walk of life, the two teams meeting in the middle of the field. Never seen that before. Braves outfielder Brian Jordan even went behind home plate before the game started to hug a woman named Carol who lost her husband, a firefighter, in the attacks. This was an intense game for so many obvious reasons, but nobody could have imagined the way that it would go. At the top of the eighth inning, the Braves would take a 2-1 lead. However, in the bottom of the eighth inning, Mike Piazza would come up to the plate. He would hit a massive two-run home run to give the Mets the lead 3-2. He hit it off Braves reliever Steve Carse, who interestingly enough grew up in Queens. The Mets would go on to win that historic game, and that game gave New Yorkers and the nation something to take their minds off of things for a few hours. It really did start the healing process for New York and the rest of the country, and it just goes to show how this game that we love gave back to us in a really big way. The 2001 postseason was also one that will be forever remembered more than most. The Yankees made it all the way back to the World Series and faced the Diamondbacks after an intense ALDS against the A's, where Derek Jeter and the flip play was born. In an iconic moment, the President of the United States, George W. Bush, threw the ceremonial first pitch before Game 3 of the World Series. The first World Series game in New York since 9-11. Initially, the president was counseled by many in his administration to throw out the first pitch for Game 1 in Arizona instead as they thought it would be safer. But he refused and went to Yankee Stadium for Game 3. He threw the ball from the rubber and tossed a perfect strike right down the middle. The Yankees would go on to win all three home games in New York. In Game 4, in extra innings, the Yankees and Diamondbacks were officially playing November November baseball for the first time in MLB history. Jeter would then hit a game-winning walk-off home run and was nicknamed Mr. November from then on. But the Yankees would lose in the World Series in seven games to the Diamondbacks in walk-off fashion against the legendary Mariano Rivera. Now let's talk media. Unless you watched games live, you had to go through the hassle of recording it and watching it later. Baseball was just straight up more accessible since everyone had cable. You didn't need different streaming packages or have to worry about blackout from streaming services, you knew which channel and what time your team was going to play, and it was as simple as turning your TV on. We had
had to live in the moment, which made these moments so special. This turns us to sports media. ESPN was incredible back then. There were few things better than turning on ESPN at night, 10 p.m. Eastern, to watch baseball tonight. Seeing a recap of the day's games with the defensive web gem segment and touch them all featuring the best home runs of the day was just simply so much fun to watch. Also, quick shout out to Pardon the Interruption with Tony Kornheiser, Michael Wilbaum, and Tony Rialli. Additional shout out to Rome is Burning with Jim Rome and Around the Horn. I loved watching those segments after school. Before the internet got to where it is now and the instantaneous nature of information, these shows were the best way to catch up and learn about what's going on around baseball and sports in general. Now, we can't talk media without talking about video games, and man, were we blessed with the best baseball games a generation could ask for. We had games like All-Star Baseball, Major League Baseball featuring Ken Griffey Jr., Backyard Baseball, MLB Slugfest, MVP Baseball, Triple Play Baseball, ESPN Major League Baseball, Sammy Sosa High Heat Baseball, and the 2K Series. And hey, Mario Superstar Baseball is pretty good, and I'll throw the bigs and the show in there, even though those came out in 06 and 07. Yeah, I know, it's a little past the time frame focus of this video, but still, the amount of variety we had during that time frame is completely unmatched. Nowadays, we only really have MLB The Show. In fact, since 2020, The Show has been the only mainline baseball game to be released, completely uncontested by anyone else. Let's move over to the action on the field. I have to give credit to the rule changes the past season or so to try to bring back what baseball was missing in this category. Today, it's all about launch angle, nobody cares about striking out, nobody cares about batting average, it's home run or bust. But not so long ago, we had it all. We had true leadoff hitters, teams with multiple players hitting above 300 with insane power numbers anyway. The shift didn't exist, so there was more defensive action to balls hit in play. Players were stealing bases regularly, which they seem to be allergic to these days. Starting pitchers would regularly throw complete games. Even Rob Manfred commented on this, saying decreased number of innings pitched by starters has not been a positive thing for the game. Starting pitchers historically have been some of our biggest stars. I think that it's important for the game that they continue to be some of our biggest stars, and I think the key to continuing that tradition is that they need to pitch more. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I agree with you, Rob, and let's be real. It's not like decreased pitch counts and inning limits have saved starters anyway. Tommy John surgeries are on wholesale these days, and every team is buying. Max Scherzer commented on this, saying that he still thinks that the lower pitch counts are bad for the generation of pitchers behind him. We're stunting young kids' growth, developing as pitchers, by removing them early in the game and not giving them a chance to fail. Okay, so let's move to a hot-button topic right now, uniforms. As of the making of this video, MLB is currently getting burned online for their fanatics and Nike jerseys that are straight up cheap looking and uniform pants that are see-through. It's kind of crazy to think how they messed something up this bad without it being broken before. And let's be real, we used to have incredible uniforms that looked and felt quality. Let's be honest with ourselves, there's a reason why teams are bringing back their throwback uniforms. The Devil Rays are back, the Florida Marlins are back, the Diamondbacks purple and teal uniforms are back, the Mets brought back their black alternate jerseys, the Cardinals and Phillies brought back their powder blue uniforms, the new City Connects take inspiration from retro uniforms like the Angels, for example, and I'm glad to see this trend coming back because the uniform designs and team logos were just so good back then. Lastly, we'll talk about the All-Star Game and the Home Run Derby. The 2019 All-Star Game was the last one to allow players to wear their team uniforms. Now, they wear All-Star Game jerseys with National League and American League on them. Although these jerseys always existed, they were worn for batting practice and the Home Run Derby only. The tradition of players wearing their home and away jerseys depending on where the game location was taking place was like iconic. It also felt and looked like players were trying during the All-Star Game back then. Starting in 2003, home field advantage was given to the winner of the Midsummer Classic. There was actually something on the line which was fun for fans and players. This ended in 2017. Now, I don't want to get too into the ballot stuffing stuff, especially with how fan voting has been in the past decade or so, but it always felt like during the late 90s and early to mid 2000s that this wasn't much of an issue. Basically, every player you wanted to see was starting and it was awesome. Now, now let's get into the home run derby. The format was perfect. It was a three round contest where eight to 10 players that were selected were to hit as many home runs as they could before reaching 10 outs. None of this time limit nonsense that we watch today where we can't even sit back and stare at a moonshot someone hit because they're already swinging again before the initial hit even reaches the stands. It feels way too fast paced and like an event that MLB just wants to be over with for the night. But I digress. ESPN was so good with the derby coverage back then and Chris Berman's iconic back 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 gone meant the summer was officially here. Hello! Back, 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 back,
We got to see the premier power hitters on a yearly basis like Ken Griffey Jr., Mark McGuire, A-Rod, Sammy Sosa, Barry Bonds, Vlad Guerrero Sr., Jason Giambi, Rafael Palmero, David Ortiz, Jim Tome, Gary Sheffield, Albert Pujols. I mean, the list goes on and on. Today, it feels like the hitters we really want to see at the Derby don't participate, and again, with the round time limits, just doesn't feel the same. So there it is. All the reasons I could possibly find as to why ratings were high, fandom felt like it was at its peak, and why baseball just felt special during the late 90s to early to mid 2000s. Thinking back, we got to see some incredible moments in a very short amount of time. It's definitely something to behold. I hope you enjoyed this video and this little walk down memory lane. What was your experience like with baseball during this time? If you have any opinions on any of this, let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Please leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. It really helps the channel out a ton. I'll catch you in the next video. Later.